Okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay. Let's get into it. The title of the episode is Treating the Mind Sorry, guys, just a second. Just a second. I got, I'm, I, I'm just setting up something. Sorry, guys. <laughs> okay, there. I found the song. All right, let's go. Um, treating the mind as a city um, I wanted to start off the new uh, the new year with doing something playful and unique and uh, I thought of a philosophy a philosophical perspective on re on things that's a very playful philosophy oftentimes in these talks um, <clears throat> I remember reading this advice from some writer that said when you can write something that will surprise you, you have written what will surprise the world. And so often when I speak, it's as if a sort of, uh, I don't want to say search, but a sort of scan for a sort of subjective uh, validity. So when I give these talks, many ideas come and go, and sometimes the, the ideology, the subjective realm, appears to me as a film behind my eyes, as if various images with various, uh, like a subtler realness to them, um, arises behind my eyes, and that's how I communicate. It, it's as if, like, um, It's only a memory if the memory itself is not a demand, is, is not its own world. So anyways, I kind of playfully, like, um, I've dedicated 2020 to really sharing um, as much as uh, I feel my eyes have opened to the realm of design. But uh, thought cityism. I thought of this playful philosophy and it's as if some people like imagine you meet a in the future a thought cityist you know <clears throat> and you're like <clears throat> what do the thought cityists believe <laughs> this is a philosophy I've kind of originated out of um, nowhere which is spelled the same way as now here And really, it's the idea of treating the subjective realm as a city. So right now, I am sitting in an objective room, and mouth noises are coming are coming across a certain, <clears throat> let's say, um, linguistic patterns that are recognizable. But the thing is that even though I am in an object, there's an objective component to my moment. I stand on the general's chair of my own universe in some sense contemplating the subjective component to the moment, which is the consciousness part, which is the free will part, which is the mind part, which is the kind of soul part, which is how the unknown moves the known, and that is not interpretable through language, and when the known moves the unknown, that is interpretable through language. When I say interpretable, that means it's as if when some when there's an unknown movement and imagine like there's um you you see a puppet for the first time and you have no idea what the strings are connected to you will ascribe the power to the puppet not to the not not even wondering about the strings of how the moment of reality is appearing to you <clears throat> What what does that mean? That means ma the intelligence of the moment of hu of human consciousness that we find ourselves in. Every person in the conscious waking state, you are objectively present and orchestrated and constituted. But there, is, but due due to this objective position being there, there can be subjective. There can be depth. It's as if depth needs a starting point. 
and the ideological self is where the depth of the world is born. So you have an objective self and you have a subjective self. The subjective self has to do with where your experiential attention goes, what, de what design it lands on. <clears throat> Sometimes wisdom is to uh, attain a selflessness where uh the the sort of reverence sacredness and the like the forbidden and the unforbidden are voices of the world sometimes it's it's very important that the human being's greatest potential is not when it has a, a kind of like it upgrades the like the iron man suit of thought it's like just because you have a bigger ego doesn't mean you see more just because somebody has more strength doesn't mean they they have they know how to use that strength it's kind of like the different kinds of warriors you would find on the battlefield. You would find warriors who wouldn't believe they are there. You would find warriors who in some sense knew they had no other choice but to confront it. You saw, you saw warriors that had already accepted their victory. Very few warriors could fight with a state of mind where it's as if they're already victorious. But the victory it doesn't have to do with... Um, <clears throat> the sense of it has to do with the sort of inner morality of whether you you feel you're doing the right thing as a being or not that means uh, what i mean by this sort of uh, um kind of sensitivity to the uh, to the subjects that the person is standing in inhabiting like a room now i want you to say that the whole no all of knowledge can be seen as a city and every ideology a sort of height a sort of influence in uh, that uh, a sort of sculpting influence upon history's shape <clears throat> so thought cityism <laughs> this playful philosophy i've created is simply this idea that we treat it's like we say that the mind it let me tell you like this the body oh what's i had this great uh just hold on guys the idea will find find me. Just give me a second. Let me see how I can say this. Sometimes it's fascinating. Behind our eyes, definitely the momentum and movement and the transitions between various subjective pictures does make us feel like there's another world there. I have contemplated life through chaos and order. And I could say that the picture I'm trying to paint right now is one that just like how we use the mind to build cities, that means a subject, some, an inspiration from the subjective realm influenced the objective realm. This is a pre-influence, how would I say it, like... This is the lighter that was in the room before the candle was lit you know the the candle of a kind of manifest existence i i consider so what it is is that one can <clears throat> use objective metaphors and give them subjective positions so just like how man used his mind from a subjective position built an objective city and civilization similarly he will treat he, he can see that he can use that metaphor of a city, of a civilization, of a, of a complex system in his inner realms and apply it to anything. That means I'm telling you that at first I find the, <clears throat> the novice that seeks for knowledge uh, is more concerned about organization. But I find greater wisdom doesn't care about organization. They care for the truth and it, it comes as a behavioral thing. There is some things like, like imagine a food you don't like. Imagine some food in this life that you, you don't like, for example. You don't like the taste of a certain food. Now I want you to see, um, in some sense, because you don't like the taste, um, does that make the fruit fruit bad? Do you know what I mean? So I'm, I'm trying to say that um, man's relationship with his mind has resulted in a sort of individual consciousness and definitions and the vocabulary of every human being. It's all coming down to images. 
remember this when you read something for example if what you're reading is not becoming a movie behind your eyes you in some sense can't even see it do you know what i mean like there was a time I, i'll share this with my youth I would read and I didn't like reading. I, like it was, I would read it slowly and it would be just like, okay, trying to make sure I get everything. It felt so slow and it took too too much time and every word had different definitions. Even when I uh, kind of wondered about like the true meaning. Thing. And eventually my mind took a different approach. And I realized my whole life I was reading too slow. I increased like the speed of my reading by like, 60% you can say and by doing that an instant film arose in my mind sometimes even a certain term that my mind couldn't be aware of because it understood the context of the story it could at least um, find certain probabilities in it and eventually the word see in life what you experience is an engagement on such a deeper level that language really at most can be a, a, like music do you know? And music has an, a meaningless beauty to it. Do you know? So this idea that one can treat their mind and see it as a city, how is it useful? Why would somebody on this planet... <laughs> choose this as a sort of philosophical perspective to entertain. It is because it opens up a sort of um, pattern to engage the unknown. You see, man wants to see something more but because he is relating to everything that he sees anew from a past position of acknowledgement, it's kind of like you're, you're as if imagine you're going to a uh, sitting at a table and your pockets are full, you know. Let's say you're like a designer and you go sit on a table and in, in both of your pockets, maybe there's a collection of like, like, you know, 100 pens, 50 pens in each pocket. You know, maybe that's too much. <laughs> let's say there's like you. There, let, let's say the person has like um, ten pens, five in each pocket, or something. Whatever. I'm just trying to say the suggestion that you enter the scene with prior reality focal points. Yes. Um, uh, I I just saw the chat, guys. Um, yes, Ivan. I agree. Yeah. There's something um, incredible that we really can't put our experiences in boxes. What we put in those boxes are simply relatable patterns. That means, um, Mr. With, like, I'm just looking at the species and wondering, all right, when are people going to wonder who's updating the dictionary? I, I'm just waiting to see any person who wonders about who wrote the dictionary is you can say one of the most some of the most intelligent people will wonder about how the definition of their moment occurs. You see, intelligence doesn't have to do with uh, repetition too much. It has to do with the ability that repetition gives you. <clears throat> what that means is I remember when I was beginning these talks when I would tell stories um, my, my sort of inner voice was still a bit, um, slower. And, uh, I remember that, uh, it was as if I was taking longer brush strokes. Nowadays, like, when I give a talk, it's like I'm drawing, I'm literally, like, drawing the talk with a pen, not like a paintbrush. When I, when I first started talk, giving these talks, imagine the talk could be seen as me kind of, like, Imagine moving one of those kind of J Japanese calligraphy brushes, you know. Of course, for me, I'm, I'm that guy who takes um, writing and uh, language um, very playfully, incredibly seriously. <laughs> you see, Carl Jung, 
this psychologist, you can also consider him as one of the first people who tried to attempt to map the unknown. Of course, there have been many things as well in, in the past. Um, uh, Happy New Year to you too, Ivan. You know. Really, honestly, for me, communication and speech and the use of the linguistic realm has an evocational relationship. That means it's like at, I, when I was younger, I would wake up and there would be a story I was waiting to just enter. Then eventually it became more silent, silent. Eventually, when a person accepts what they what naturally comes to them, they, they in some sense cultivate new dimensions. Carl Jung says it is the sign of an unconscious mind. Sorry, he doesn't say that. <laughs> Jung says, um, Unless you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. So in some sense, Carl Jung was a human being that was interested in the unknown factors of reality. Like right now when I'm speaking, I'm interested in the unknown factor. I realize people before I was born, they were called mystics. They were interested in the unknown factor. They may have been in, interested in it very extremely. But every generation will have... The, it's kind of like the design of the cosmos, guys. <clears throat> this is why I say we are by birth philosophical creatures. The moment the child looks at its mind, it looks at itself in the mirror and realizes itself as a sort of stable point of kind of momentary attention where various images can be entertained the thing is um before i was it's like this that like imagine a camera lens right so imagine the thought that comes to you in a moment is the lens of that moment and you as a being eventually reach a sort of point of will where you realize how is it that you have incredible freedom to move your body now imagine you, you had the same freedom to, as you move your body, you had it with the mind, but how does the mind move? And this is where, Mr. Within, like, this is why I'm here, to tell you that how the next, how the unknown atmosphere of the mind is, is that it's a collective relationship. And collectivity for an individual being means the confrontation of emptiness. It means the confrontation of its individual non-existence. And so man can do two things. He can either throw his hat in the air or he can throw his hat and give his hat to someone and then enter, in some sense, the truth of the moment. You see, the idea was this, guys. It, it all starts with philosophical axioms. Once the child identifies as a creature of thought, imagine that thought being a point, and as the child goes through experiences that are pleasant and unpleasant, eventually there comes various lines in, like imagine, like axes. So imagine like Earth has an axis now. Imagine like, because it's a sphere, we it, like, in, how can I say it? Of course, Earth couldn't be an example. You can say the axis of a sphere is um, here. It, it comes down to this, that if two spheres are spinning around each other in empty space, which is spinning around which? It's the sign suggestion of moving intelligence before, in, in some sense, direction arising. So what does that mean? That means our evolution was the experience of speed. That was the, that's pretty much what happens for an individual creature, anything. Even if I if man was to create right now, when I when I was younger, I I I, I had kind of like ins, uh, aspirations to, you know, invent, right? I felt it was cool creating something as capable as man, right? But um. <clears throat> I, so if we were to create a sort of robot here, for example, this robot, as because it's an individual, a kind of being acknowledged as an individual system, as, as an individual point, its direction and the, it, the speed that it goes to its direction will suggest what we, what we see of its intelligence. It's kind of like the, that, that. This is why children kind of like um, it, it's it's like um, they they have to step out of a sort of uh, emotional simulation.
right? Emotional, comfortable simulation. At some point, think of it this way. There is levels of maturity in existence as a moving experience. One is, in some sense, the person becomes aware of their emotion. Only when you can be aware of your emotion, suddenly you, to some degree, get access to being aware of thought. Now, when you get become aware of thought, the next thing is an is a sort of it, it's like you move from you. It's like it's like stepping stones. It's as if the entity went through an emotional experience of existence, then went into a subjective, and then from that subjective managed to consider an objective. Do you know? <clears throat> so what that means is. We were. It's as if we man was wondering about how many dimensions there are in the cosmos. He 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 searched and he found another, and then he found another. Then he's like, okay, what if there's another? And and then he kept searching, and eventually he realized it's kind of like the carrot and the stick situation. Human beings have to be capable of not just stepping out of physical rooms, like in a house, like. Moving, <laughs> moving around in a house, but they must also be capable of moving between various subjective rooms. I'm saying that the whole species is worshipping language. Ever since idol worship, ob the worshipping, seeing only objects as truth stopped, right? Eventually it became to subjects. Suddenly words out of nowhere became universes of significance on their own, simply because the symbol could evoke for the person their own universe. You see, it's kind of like uh, you can say, let's say 100 people believing in the same I idea. It's as if they are the limbs of the that idea, if that idea was a collective entity. To be honest, the freedoms that are truly experiential are freedoms that have nothing to do with the story. We have to realize on some level the human being is um, uh, um, re reacting to various views of itself. I'll give, I'll give you myself for, for an example. You know, I've had moments where I have simply been an observer literally i've awoke, woken up from the day and i've had no thought no idea of self you know i see myself in the mirror in the morning but i just kind of function and there has been times where i have seen there has been no idea of the self literally no language required the moment is so simply present that it's like before i move there's no need for movement you know, this is why Shri Ramana Maharshi says silence is also a conversation because samadhi is, is becoming the field uh, in which the particle is in. Uh, but before samadhi, it's as if you are in the struggles of a particle. You can say uh, any time there is an individual, the, a character in a story is in a karmic loop. Um, my attention has come to the chat. Uh, Ivan, you say symbolic interactionalism is almost mandatory to fundamental learning state. Yeah. Of, uh, and I find that you, that the symbolic interaction is happening even before, like prior to me learning words, what I saw objectively was a language. Do you know? It's as if, um, Imagine, like, this is, I found this to be fascinating. There were certain shamanic kind of cultures, I don't know, maybe like give it like, I don't know, 500 to 1,000 years ago or something. But the thing was, the idea was, they, it, they had this weird ceremony where the child, after it was born, they would keep it in a dark cave. They would keep it in a dark cave and the child would not leave that dark cave at, until it was 18 years old. Do you know what that means? That means the child was kept in a simulation for 18 years. And then the child, after 18 years, the cave would open and the child would go out. And when the child would go out, it would see a world and it would know the value of the world. This is why those who come, you see, civilization is incredible. Because... <coughs> Success never had to do with class. It had to do with what you cared about. Because what you care about endures. 
you will wake up tomorrow still caring for it. There is there is a meaning in in, in that attention, in, in what in that reference point of attention. I have experienced moments where I felt there was uh, a divine illusion. There, I have experienced moments where I have I have felt as if I did not exist. And it's as if before I was named, how could nature be separated? When I say separated, it's not unified love. Love has been confused. Love was a state of the mind of the warrior. That means in, in, in the battle of great minds, the mind that could give freedom first. That means this is something they don't say, but the sages know, I find. You know? And when I say sages, I'm talking about those who abide by the Tao. In other words, is for the unspeakable presence of the moment. So they're actually as if, like, imagine every movement in their moment is the voice of the world. It's as if life will pull the rug from underneath your feet, and then after that, you begin looking at the ground, wondering what the ground, how the ground is truly. How many rugs there are under your feet? How many, how many stories have occupied your attention? How much your desires are just past moments of expression? Do you know what that means? That means imagine you were playing a chess game in one moment and you never got to make a move you really wanted. And that, then you couldn't play that chess game and time went on and that chess game was just a memory. So in that memory, there is the emotion of the movement. My memories to me, they're not just one memory the mem any sort of memory is a viewpoint is it not as if you are that you are as if a director behind the camera seeing a certain scene seeing a certain um, um, value to a moment so if you pay attention and if the mind I say this that you kind of the person who can confront stillness and silence uh, they are able to confront any sort of movement and noise simply because if the movement and noise fails or succeeds, they have acknowledged the silence. There's this playful story. I don't know how, how I think it was, um, there was, um, so there's this story that Galileo comes out of court and he's like this older man and he has a cane and he hits his cane on the earth, you know, and he says, I know you're going around the sun. I know you're around. <laughs> so as if he lost in court, but he came and he, he his own truth was um, superior to the character he required to be for a sort of collective audience. You see, the thing is, people have to understand that... Um, this certain subtlety of realizing you're going through different rooms. Just think about it, how, mu how much of an incredible metaphor it is. Now imagine these rooms being part of unknown houses. So what does that mean? That means, let's say man stepped out of the, uh, went, saw a portal. Okay, let's say some person's in a room, uh, the, a wall becomes a portal. They enter that portal and they're in a different room. Now that room... They don't know in what kind of house it is and that house in what kind of world it is. Do you know? They just know that they are in a, in a space as much as the mind is capable to become familiar with. I found something very fascinating. <clears throat> you know, there was this kind of mentality because certain religious viewpoints, you got to understand, religion is, is kind of strange. It's extreme, in, it's in its intensity, um... Uh, how can I tell you? The moment there are eyes watching you, your free will feels a bit irresponsible of itself. A sort of, how can I tell you? It's like um, when you can cry, let your, like let's say you find yourself in a moment where you're actually crying, that moment, if you can endure that, and then you endure a moment, which is this metaphor in a lot of these talks, 
the pilot of consciousness I'm saying now the pilot is imagine the whole mo the content of the whole moment is like the plane of existence and the attention navigating through the pilot in the plane of existence that's it's like a perfect metaphor you know the pilot is navigating the the direct attributeless experiential attention which arises from a non-dual field like state it individualizes so believe it or not human intelligence this whole game of individual consciousness everything we see from humanity this evolution of ours is not a supreme constant evolution it's just the peak of a wave it's the peak of a wave imagine we should study evolution not just from what has occurred on land not just from the surface of land but from the surface of oceans and seas and if you pay attention to the design of this world, knowledge pours out of it. If you're not attentive to the design, then in some sense your own mind locks down. That means I'm telling you, try this. Imagine you're a person who realizes why waste time lying ever. Why? Because whether you lie or not, life has a sort of consequence. So why not live every moment just to see what your honest self is, as if on some level you have opened your eyes in this existence to see yourself first. Do you see? So after you see yourself first, then when you see others, guess what? You're every person, because they know themselves first, then others in some sense, it becomes one of those things where when they see others, they relate them to themselves. Because what else do we have in this island in the cosmos so the mind has to be a city has to be built and you can say man's conscious effort to move into the unknown must have an influence right you can't enter a room without changing something in it <clears throat> sometimes when you enter a reality it's like a door opens and many things enter that reality alongside the conscious being Life is something where um, our subjective realms now are in the hands of our free will to some degree. And the species can't stay in itself too long. The caterpillar, regardless of its philosophy, regardless of its belief, regardless of its morality, regardless of its ignorance or clarity, the caterpillar had to enter the cocoon. A complete moment of silence, stillness, and a pure moment where the last cell of the caterpillar dies. The last fragmented sense of self stops. It's as if the gears are slowly stopping of a vehicle, vehicle that, were, that was of a, of a machine that was headed the wrong way. I found a perfect solution, not a perfect solution, but I think maybe a noteworthy solution to the issue with the AI and technological civilization. I feel there should come this law that um, bans technological advancement for a certain period of time and allows it do you know after so in that time where it's banned let's say right now we say i mean this is just a kind of example but imagine the civilization was designed it, it had become one global unity so what that means is every part of it could update instantly when one part of it updated consciously that's the power of globalization guys some people may feel that as, the, as more people are born in the world and as, they, as these creatures explore the world, eventually what happens is human beings have to settle down somewhere, right? When they settle down, they have to accept the place. That means make sure that uh, you're a person who finds um, a moment you can trust enough to stay in. You know, you, you have to on some level in this life, as one approaches death, it becomes important to uh, make uh, start walking in the Garden of Paradise earlier. So what I mean by that is that um, it's kind of fascinating. It's like 50% of life, um, your body's going to run for its dreams. And 50% of life...
the mind never needed to question reality. Honestly, communication is like endlessly creating instant Iron Man suits. I'm telling you, it's language is a technology. It can never be us. It can never be us. The dictionary is not a hoax. Language is just hollow. This is a, I find this will be the apocalypse of, for the educational system. What that means is the educational system is abiding by nature. What that means is there is a consequence to greed that the philosophers understood. You don't know how many philosophers in history, just human beings, who in certain moments, they saw, some, they saw a dimension to their civilization where they had to communicate. There's this, um, I believe it was this um, Native American poet who she wrote, she had this kind of quote, I have, I have, I can't remember it verbatim, but it's like, <clears throat> she's like, then I find myself uh, looking behind me and seeing all my ancestors kind of looking at me and saying you're the love of thousands i don't know i i feel like the idea went around those lines like it's pretty close to that pretty much this lady realizing that her ancestry had a vision so it's like when i spoke to my grandfather i suddenly realized every like his mind has a had a vision for his life every human being has a vision for their life and if they're subjective, if the future, which can be said to be imagination, hoped to be real. <laughs> right now, if I wonder what tomorrow is going to look like, I may get a sort of glimpse, a sort of idea. But in this moment, that idea is, is, is not in the objective space, like is relevant to the objective space. In other words, what hasn't happened cannot be fully experienced. Intelligence without vision is a incredible Ferrari without a driver. The fascinating thing is we have popped into conscious existence and the moment we have popped, we have to take responsibility for things, you know. I feel like sharing a story that I don't commonly share It's the story of Hafez, the Sufi mystic poet He said that he went to Attar, this like next level, like this, this kind of like more, more kind of like his mentor, like who he, Attar is a person who was so wise that his poetry was so profound that he was, uh, Hafez wanted to become his mentor. In one of his poems, he's writing this. And he goes to Attar and he says, I want to be your disciple. And Attar says, no. And this no is so heavy for Hafez. that he just instantly leaves, goes to the desert, draws a circle, sits in the circle, and decides not to leave this circle as he's there, kind of like, like it's a, it, it only incredible universal importance causes a being to want to release all their desires. It's very uncommon. 
for a human being to want to if for children it's common to the, for them suddenly want to enter a utopia but for for a person in a dystopia to to suddenly be able to get rid of all the uh, get, be able to see something else aside from the dystopia first then that's that's like I don't know it becomes like very profound so anyways after 40 days Hafez suddenly something unique happens all his desires leave they evaporate they are no longer in his attention it's as if he he has lost the hunger to keep an idea uh, a temporary idea uh, to keep um, the blindfold you know on his face and so he after 40 days you know, an angel comes to him. This is like in his poetry. Hafez is kind of writing this. He says, an angel comes to him and says, Hafez, heaven will authorize anything if you ask. What is it that you want from heaven? Heaven will give you anything. And in that moment, Hafez is so desireless that he is silent. There is nothing. And the angel realizes that there's nothing this man wants. There is no hell or heaven. There's no marketplace. There's no, there, in some sense, it's in some sense, just the Hafez is desireless. And the, as the angel in some sense uh, leaves, returns to the void, in some sense, Hafez stands up. And he just starts walking towards Attar's door. And Attar just already, as if, he, as if his heart has seen the moment ahead, he in some sense is, oh, opens the door and he's waiting there for him, you know? And he says, now you can be my disciple. Now you are a human being who has just been able to manage to step out of the room of your whole individual story to look at life from that novel view. What is that middle way Buddha was talking about? What's this whole emptiness all the Zen masters are talking about? Eventually it comes down to how experience is acknowledging what is. And so when you realize from a, from a state of pure being arises in pure actions. <laughs> so what I mean by that is that it's like the purity is in its own dimension. The impurity is in its own dimension. It's just where the attention has been, how the attention has navigated. We are creatures that are... Uh, if, we, if we remain as a creature of thought, our only means of movement is our body. But if we realize we're creatures of attention, we can consciously navigate through language. Conscious na navigation through language is when the be being's intelligence is oriented to the quality of the experience of the moment rather than any sort of structure or blueprint. That means it's like... It's just like how Hafez, in, in that story, he had to, literally, that was the final test. And he then knew, when he wanted nothing from the cosmos, then he could truly hear what the cosmos wanted from him. Again, a, a, a kind of um, remembrance of your own attention. I mean, you're, we're, all, we're all on a rock in the middle of nowhere. How fascinating and strange. You know, imagine this person, <laughs> this kind of idea inspired a book I'm writing. Um, this person suddenly has an audience, like s suddenly uh, he had, like he entered, let's say the person enters heaven and in heaven he can ask a God, God a question and God is there and he's like, what, what's up? And the person in heaven is saying, God, one thing you got to answer me. And God's like, all right, here, let's see what other, qu what question is, is it going to be? And man says, why a sphere? Why did you choose a sphere? Do you see? And one view is, in some sense, this is strange, but it's a burst out of nowhere. So from, it's like, non-existence is simply the portal we can't see what's behind it but from it something arises there can be that view because it tends to seem that a lot of things in nature appear with a sort of yin yang balance a sort of dualistic symmetry so what does that mean that means kind of wondering okay so right now i'm experiencing myself as an individual body okay and in a subjective space 
you know, an individual, a kind of material creature in a vast material kind of space, you know, and a lot of human meaning and psychology and all this is all hilariously based on man's uh, relationship with the earth. There was one thing in the movie Gladiator that um, kind of was very profound that the guy before fighting, he would get the dirt and kind of clean his hands with the dirt. That's another way of saying is uh, trying to access the honest strength. The honest strength is not searching, is not perf You see, there's two, there's different kinds of performance. There's a performance that the person is, is looking too much through the audience's eyes. And then there's a performance where the person doesn't even see the audience's eyes. They are just in some sense being an expression of their inner realm. I find that um, just like the mind-body dualism, just like the pure-impure dualism, <clears throat> when we acknowledge thought as rooms, we don't get possessed by it. We can choose to stay in the room or to leave the room. We can choose to shift the state of mind or not shift the state of mind. So really what it is, is pretty much like nothing's been going on until eyes could see something. I remember um, being introduced um, in my youth to uh, a passage which uh, came from uh, the Islamic holy book, the Quran. And it, it was this idea that the creator has made this world for you. And it was such a profound thing that I kind of have this belief that all ideas are born of their moment's value. That means if a person records a talk in an airport, the sound of the airport is going to come into that talk. It's very fascinating. We are like, leap, our attention is leaping through various moments of uh, sensory shift that leads to which uh, a sort of shifting self-identification you know what it is is I think we're kind of like biological projectors and language is kind of like a subjective projection so when we wonder about the projection we come down to the projector when we wonder about the projector we come down to a power source now this power source, different traditions acknowledge it differently. For example, what, what the secular society calls the laws, scientific laws of nature uh, to the Abrahamic religious society is kind of like the will of God. You don't know how many times in various countries I've been in situations and I can enter, totally entertain that idea because the unknown is so beautiful that um, it's like where the known wants to go. After 4 billion years of evolution, there's consciousness. Consciousness can't do much. It can only be or it can do, you can say. And kind of a balance between both is called abiding. So all these mystics that say abide by your true nature, what they mean is um, accept what you are so you can work with it. So never have an irrational society. So the middle way is not just a mystical solution, it's also a collective solution. It's the recognition that um, prior to any choice, 
it, it's there is a kind of landscape of various parallel potentials. I want to speak a little bit, guys, about the picture I've chosen. Um, I'd appreciate it if you can make um, the wallpaper for this, like talk uh, full screen, so the video full screen. I want you to really closely look at this wallpaper and kind of notice what it is. And you will see it is some, I don't know who the artist was when I saw the picture, but it is this incredible genius genius level illustrators way of kind of showing how sort of futuristic societies can kind of occur and what it means is it's just like how cells copy themselves right to become something greater similarly the efficient patterns in civil civilization copy themselves but they copy themselves through people's minds We have to realize it is the free will, free will of 8 billion homo sapiens sapiens that the meaning of the world kind of it's in the hands of humanity's vision <clears throat> as far as our species see suggests like do you know, it's like all, all the creatures on this planet are like, you know, it's it's kind of like, you know how in Spider-Man, <laughs> in the movie Spider-Man, it was like uh, Uncle Ben is dying, you know? And the soup bowl of <laughs> uh, Peter Parker's kind of emotional life breaks. His uncle says, with great power comes great responsibility. In other words, his, his, he says mindfulness. Now, we are the most advanced species on this planet. Guess what? Great power. We have great power. Now, with great power comes greater responsibility. Now, if humanity wanted to wonder about even greater versions of responsibility for itself, it has to wonder about greater power. And what it is, is always a mutation of a simpler form, you know, into more complex, more complex. Eventually, the complexities become infinitely crystallized. When they become infinitely crystallized, again, it comes back to the void. It's as if, like, believe it or not, there is a life cycle to um, subjective movements of attention, uh, uh, the movement of attention through, through subjectivity. Um, so guys, um, I'm looking at the chat now. Um, if you guys can elaborate what you're asking. <laughs> Silence is, um, <clears throat> Cindy, um, what I mean by silence is really it's kind of like the absence of dynamic thought. So right now I can just sit here and just watch the moment, just like how a person watches TV. Imagine you watch, you can watch the moment. It doesn't matter if you're suffering. It doesn't matter if you're having joy in every moment of one's being, they can always watch the moment. Now, the realization that the watcher within is not limited to an individual dualistic kind of oriented language means that we human beings have been sold on, our, on a story too soon. 
it's as if like our few our like the children of the future generations are looking at us now and they're like okay are, is this generation going to snap out of the, the kind of illusion or not <clears throat> the linguistic simulation or not right language is beautiful and at the same time the way it can be used can also be ugly Silence is an ability to realize that without emptiness, how would you know something is full? And without silence, it's as if I will tell you, if you want to become the, uh, in increase your um, vocal rhythmic communication, all you got to do is just ex uh, be cont ob observe silence to a point where you're content with it. Life is so fascinating that um, the wrong idea can obstruct its greatness. You know, this is the situation, guys. There comes a great sacrifice with um, vision. For example, Nostradamus, this kind of French predictor, <laughs> this Frenchman who, a philosopher who you can say he had sort of prediction that some people believe that came, it came true, some people believe it didn't. But I want to tell you something from a writer's viewpoint. Uh, on what he was going through when he was writing those predictions. There's a sacrifice. There's a... Um, uh, just a second, guys. It's the, it's, the, it's the emotional sacrifice of the desires of the, of the egoic desires of the present moment to allow the imagination to wonder of a future. What that means is imagine this idea that a thought that enters your mind, the moment it enters your mind, it has been born in, as part of your subjective universe. Now, when it leaves, it dies. So now you are that attention before the thought is born and also the attention that will watch it after. This is why I say your attention is the god of your thought. This is why I say we are pilots of attention. And this attention is, is so dynamic and alive, you can't really put it in a box of a, of, of, of a term. Words can only take us so far and then eventually our experiences will enter the unknown to a degree where through the discomfort and through the true access. It's as if the, the human being was born and it's like before life could give it illusion or truth, the person was like, life, whether you give me illusion or truth, let me see the real you. That, that uh, intention to wonder about the depths of a, a potential vision, every mind harbors their own intelligence. It's like I'm telling you, th the fact that we are different means there is more to share. In this picture, we see an advanced city. Maybe not an advanced civilization, just by seeing this picture, we can't know the ideologies and the kind of philosophical values of the civilization, but we can kind of see in this picture that man found a way to build a pure land. He managed to build something that reached, like in this picture, I don't think many people realize, but this is a city in the air 
<clears throat> or it is so far that it's clouds underneath. And there's highways and cities, people going in the streets, there's stores. Technology will at some point not care about natural light and kind of simulate it. In this picture, I see the evolution of the past. It's kind of strange, but you can say, you know, <laughs> Heraclitus had this quote where he said, no man steps in the same river twice, and it's not the same man, and it's not the same river. You know, so now if Heraclitus uh, considered he was a time traveler, right? So in every moment, like he would consider he's a, he's a different kind of time traveler, you know? The person wants to travel in time in one dimension, but suddenly realizes there's another dimension where they're traveling to a different date, you know? And then another dimension where they're traveling, another new moment, new moment. Eventually, we are creatures that we are, we're simply... Believe it or not, this isn't what I feel it is. It's, it's, it's uh, attention that's navigating through manifestation that appears elemental and is subjectively categorized and the subjectification of it, even the need to kind of wonder about the world comes if there is a question deep enough. <clears throat> that means when my approach was, uh, some people told me when I was giving these talks, they were like, why don't you promote your own talks? And I thought like it was something cool where I'm like, I'll just put the artwork out there and I'll see who sees it and what, like who sees a similar kind of more of a collective effort towards civilization. It, it can't be just individual problems, a problem and solutions problem like it can't be just individual problem solving eventually it has to be that every human being's mind their mind becomes a warrior in space and time think about it Th just think about this idea that right now you felt like you were part of uh, the army of human minds and as a human mind you potentially could see something that could serve reality I find every human being goes through so many states in life that if they just care about what is r truly real to them, that once they trust the, the, their attention, then they will trust every, their navigation in every idea. It's kind of like a secret kind of shortcut the yogis didn't say. You know, the yogis, uh, people said to the yogis, <clears throat> you know, um, is this the truth? And the yogis were like, not this, not this, neti neti, as it is written in the Upanishads. You know, but that same yogi could have been said, it's not in language. It's just that every human being is identifying with language and it's like an astronaut leaving the atmosphere of, its, of the egoic con comfort zone of that moment. You see, people, I feel there's no such thing as a strong person and there's no such thing as a weak person. There is a journeyer that experiences various elevations of energetic being and those various elevations lead to states of mind. <clears throat> that means there have been times where I remember there was a time where I, I, I was in this situation where I had to drive uh, like a couple hours, like two hours, and... Um, I'm kind of driving on this highway from Barrie to Toronto and it's like past midnight and the, I'm reaching a point where the car and everything is becoming too, too like um, cozy. Do you know what I mean? And so the most immediate, the first thing I did was like, okay, I got to keep myself up. So I just put like this head, like this, like lecture, like some kind of heavy lecture, like on YouTube like some professor talking about something, something complicated. I put the complicated thing to keep my mind engaged, like to always have it like right there. And um, as I was going, the moment I noticed I'm getting tired, I realized because it's like you got to kind of, uh, you got to, um, 
separate your back from the chair if you're on a long journey and you got to drive a lot. Your back shouldn't be on the chair, you know, <clears throat> uh, touching the chair. Uh, and so I remember I just make this journey and I remember the whole thing was that like, I, like when a person drives, when you're in a vehicle, that vehicle becomes a sort of subtle body for you. So a true, true person who can navigate a vehicle, it's as if that vehicle, they can feel the space and distance. Even if the vehicle passes by a tree, the person, driver, can feel that distance away from that tree. Do you know? <clears throat> so I remember I, as, as the journey was happening, so I put on this lecture and I'm like paying attention to the road and I'm driving. And as I'm getting even like various kind of like elevations, of course, you keep, I kept kind of like opening and closing the window. <clears throat> but eventually I noticed that in the, it, behind my attention, I just concluded. It's like I was too tired to endlessly recalculate. So I just kept one point of attention endlessly static. So it's as if like a, a sense of self that is looking at the moment that is unwavering, you know? So it's, it's kind of strange, but like a person can, and think of it this way, if your mind can conceptualize matter, it can like when you think about matter, like a sort of vision arises, you can say it's also that it can also, when it wonders about nothing, emptiness, it's, it's something arises. I found out that in some sense, guys, I have been walking also in cities of language, cities of beliefs. The mind, I couldn't see it when I was younger because the story of, because I, like my desires had kind of, made me ignorant of what was truly valuable. At some point, you just realize if you don't have a clear view on your environment, you really can't navigate in it. You know, the pilot sees ahead and then moves. The mystic observed the moment, then concluded. He, the, did, the mystic didn't conclude, then try to observe, you know. So, but the reason I'm saying that is that on some level, it's an experiential movement. On another level, it's just like a momentary kind of traveling through a sort of subjective landscape. One can see multidimensionality in everything. Even you open the dictionary, you see like a, a word can have multiple meanings. A word can have... Um, Language can be used in various ways to project reality. Internal freedom really arises when the internal and external are no longer fighting. And as he's about to talk to all the elders, his grandson runs out of nowhere and says, Grandpa, tell me a story, like his happy grandson comes, you know. And it, the whole tribe is like, all right, let's, let's see the wisdom of this chief, you know? And so in that moment, the grandfather is, is like, it's, it's, he's like such an awesome person that he just kneels down to the level of his grandson. What does that mean? The, that's, the, that's the strength of human civilization, to be able to kind of come down to, to a sort of a level of other beings. Do you know? It's not a singular dimensional responsibility, it's a multidimensional sense of responsibility. The grandfather notices the eyes of the elders are on him and his grandson has come and he has to literally forget everything and listen to the soul of his grandson. As if nature didn't just move 
in that fight, fighting inside me, you know. The grandfather says one wolf stands for the archetypes of suffering, hatred, imbalance. The other stands for the archetypes of balance, peace, discipline, in some sense, you know, order. So in other words, the grandfather is looking at his grandson and saying, the grandfather is saying to his grandson, dear human being, notice that you're in a world where every moment chaos, chaotic ideas and ordered ideas may arise. Chaotic emotions and ordered emotions may arise. These wolves are endlessly fighting. And then the grandson and even the elders want to know. They're fascinated by the story. The, the grandson says to the grandpa, so which wolf wins, grandpa, if they're fighting? And the grandpa looks at his grandson knowing that he, the grandson won't understand the answer until years later. And he says, the one you feed. And all the chief elders in that moment took up their social media and kind of like updated their feed. You know? <laughs> but uh, <laughs> the idea is that um, attention, attention is how you feed it. And chaos and order are simply landscapes. You know, you can't take a bouquet of roses and smell them beside a dumpster and imagine it's just smell roses, you know. You can't kind of like, even the same thing is there with true, uh, you see with um, the, the good and evil is, um, it's as if there are puppets, uh, there are puppets where the strings you're holding, but you suddenly realize the free will is a puppet where the strings are from the unknown. So man's relationship with the unknown will always evolve uh, any moment. Any moment the human being is, can be simple enough, decent enough, just, just simple. Simple and just as if like there's no longer an inner child because it's like the person is still them. It's like when have you ever not been you? <clears throat> it's as if the person travels many, but this is an incredible like... It's something very profound to realize that the human being, literally imagine how many different places on this uh, uh, planet you've been. And maybe not just even countries. Imagine just how many different locations you have gone through throughout your whole lifetime.
Okay, guys, to continue. The issue is the person has one lifetime to wonder about what they are. And if certain kind of semi-visible Im images, subjective images, deny the person their exploration or some sort of fear, it's as if some, there's some attitude. <clears throat> Somebody said, hey man, aren't you afraid? And then the guy's like, who has time for fear? <laughs> who has time in, 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 the, in the moment where engagement and intention must arise? It's as if like in that moment, in the battlefield, you don't have time for ethics. You don't have time for anything. It's just observe the moment, uh, move, navigate. Observe the moment, navigate. You know, a lot of people, I'll, I'll tell you, it's hilarious. It's like a wave of spirituality hit culture. And many people feel that this, I think the ultimate conclusion of many people who entertain a spiritual perspective is that this is an educational planet. I, don't, I can't tell you from how many different people eventually their conclusion has been that. That it's a sort of um, background hierarchical evolution. You know, even Rumi, the poet, had this idea where he says kind of he evolved from the mineral kingdom and went up to the plant kingdom and then went up to the animal kingdom and then went up to a sort of angelic kingdom and then went on to the inconceivable. <clears throat> Sorry, he went after the animal kingdom and went on to man and then went on to the angelic dimension and then went to the inconceivable. So you see, every person <clears throat> has been um, um, diving into the void with a plan. <laughs> With, a, with an idea. But I find that when a person realizes there, there is a part of their intelligence beyond the language threshold, you laugh at everything any human being has ever said to you. You'll realize how rare it is that really like, um, I'll tell you, the best thing that the eyes of others can be to the self is a mirror. It was kind of like the mystical strategy to kind of world peace. They're like, how do we bring world peace? It's like, put a mirror in front of everybody's face. <laughs> so anyways, guys, um, whether we're evolving into the inconceivable, whether the future is a collective moment that doesn't experience linear time, so it has access to all moments of time, whether time travel is traveling like a line in, 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 in like a space, it, it becomes like traveling like it's like rather than the ego flying among in, in between the between the trees the ego is flying from the sky where it's observing all of it what that means is we have many moments of non-identification you know even though we identify through language we speak you know we communicate similarly there are many moments where the person is just doing an activity and they're not a thought it's as if you ask a very simple people who are just uh, like you you go ask of uh, like um a villager like how are you doing what's up what are you thinking about it's as if the, the intention their attention is more drawn to it's like every environment if you stay in it long enough it'll affect the speed of your thinking it'll affect your uh, attention the thing is the attention is like you have you are either feeding it um uh wonder You're either, feeding, you're either feeding it wonder or you're, how can I tell you? It's like Christopher Columbus got bored. And that's why he got on that boat. And regardless of how he handled it, I think something people have to realize about Christopher Columbus, like I'm just saying if we were to look from his eyes, this dude was on the longest kind of perhaps like breaking the Guinness World Records of that didn't even exist at that time. Like... He, 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 he was on the longest boat journey of his life. 
when he got there, I could say it's probably fair to say that he probably needed a month of just calming down to return to a civil state of mind. But unfortunately, I think the natives met him sooner than that time period. And what I mean by that is, is like, of course, the chaos of man, you can't, uh, if, if a system is designed inefficiently, you can't hide it. Like, that's, that's the case, too. It's as if, like, who knows? Maybe the intentions were different. But I'm saying that it's like seasickness is real. <laughs> and so a man with a seasick mind could make crueler decisions than necessary. <clears throat> Exploration of the unconscious. I think it all comes down to this. Every person experiences a sense of unknown. Your relationship with your knowledge is, believe it or not, based on that. And only when a person can become comfortable with not knowing, they can really see things. It's as if, like, many people think they have to choose between good and bad. And sure, you can. But the moment you, ident you, you go into one suit, you're going to be drawn, like, the opposite's going to be your right, reference point. It's as if you can say there are three audience members and some person gives a talk and one audience member jumps up and just says incredible, bravo, like this, like some, as if the person seen Beethoven, you know. Then the second person is just seated down, you know, and is clapping and the, thir and the third person is not clapping at all. And this is the metaphor you can say for, for the traditional body, mind, soul. The body is, is re, re alive in accordance to its intense expression, right? The mind is less expressive. It's like 50% expressive, 50% observant. And then the soul is just pure observance. That's why the soul has no story. The soul is like the X factor in, in a mathematical equation, like an unknown variable. So I'm saying our, our knowledge, there's glitches in the system. There's unknown variables. Black, hole, black holes aren't just in outer space. They're also in our inner space, you know? An example of that would be the hard problem of consciousness, would be the mysteries of dark matter and dark energy. You know how in some sense certain, a, a, a galactic group in some sense gets pulled away from another galactic group, but what's in that galactic group, get, they're all pulled together. Like it's, you know, it, it's, it's kind of like, Nature is too fascinating. Nature's voice is how it expresses itself. Um, wisdom of the human species can elevate to a degree where the person realizes this oscillation throughout the day between a more of an objective significance to the moment, more of a subjective significance to the moment. Right now, my body is simply just chilling and like my hands may move like as I talk. You know, but um, and I'm aware of like my throat and my voice box and all this, but it's at the same time <clears throat> without the silence, there is no stage, without emptiness, there is no mystery of matter. The miracle is that there is something, the first miracle is that there is something here, the second miracle is that this thing that's here is aware that it's here. And superior minds of ideas. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. I agree with you. Um, guys, my attention is on the chat section. Yeah. Um, it, I, t I totally understand that this life needs multidimensional management and it, and it needs singular contentment. You can say the person has to live in a house. Um, you know, at, at this point in civilization, we need shelter, uh, organized shelter and efficient shelter. And then there's a situation where it's about the inner structures of the being. So think of it this way. You're an architect and you have designed incredible and an incredible um, um, 
living space for yourself. Your external reality is content. You know you have ability to build a house, for example. Now, I want you to, you are now, after finding pure contentment with the architecture of the external realm, now wondering about the extension, the extension of this sort of external architecture. It's as if the other side of the coin, the inner universe, the inner architecture. I have this, um, I'm going to say this in, a, 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 in, in, in the science fiction novel I'm working on called The Messenger of Giants. Um, there's, a very, there's a very interesting chapter which is called Memphisto's Denial. And um, this chapter is a perfect metaphor for what I mean. Something that happens. It, I'm, I won't get into the whole chapter, but pretty much Memphisto is, is the most in this. Okay, so the year is 5025. There are nine parallel dimensions of Earth, but only th uh, three or four of them are aware that there is nine parallel dimensions of Earth. The other ones have not evolved and are not even aware or some of them have like messed up kind of endings in them, right? So this, the situation is in the year 5025, Memphisto is this human architect, this kind of, uh, yeah, he's human. He's, he's this human architect that has managed to build a building between two parallel realities. So he has become the most famous, famous architect instantly in two parallel realities. So the idea is he's, and I kind of wrote it in, in, in my novel as if the idea is that uh, imagine a sky rise and like half of the sky rise goes above the cloud, up to the clouds. But when you go above the clouds, you see nothing there. Now in the other dimension, above the clouds and beyond, there's the rest of the sky rise, you know, in the two different parallel realities. <clears throat> Do you see what I mean? So you, you start from one platform in the moment from one position and then there is a conscious extension there's a constant extension of attention into various um, ways that thought happens it's as if think of it this way a person cares for their own behavior so similarly care for the behavior of your thoughts you can't own thought because the moment you own to it the weight of the world is too heavy you become like atlas from greek mythology You can say somebody who's watching like the New Year's, <clears throat> for example, like the New Year countdown, suddenly last second their attention goes away from um, Just a second guys, sorry. Sorry guys, I just had to, there was a memory problem on the laptop.
the world becomes heavy if a person wants to change it to be honest it was it was said that it's it was the fool's errand to change the world because the fool only sees the world they see at first <clears throat> and this is why too much power given to any individual human archetype will cause the archetype to break or mutate not to mutate to in some sense shift right so the thing is it's it's about the speed of the sequence of the ideologies that arise that kind of are subjective designs so kind of i would say that the thoughts throughout the day is a kind of like another way of saying me noticing various geometric patterns uh, uh throughout the day you know imagine like everything i'm saying right now is can simply just be sound it doesn't need to have the meaning in it the meaning of course is something where every audience every member has to kind of like extract their own kind of from the sound but it's like the era of advanced communication where our, we treat our minds with a sophistication uh, and a organization of free will that it's as if like um, behind your eyes um, the idea of the external city is being utilized for the free will to to see different ways experiences open up for it <clears throat> you can say it's as if like space is experiencing matter but because it's space the space part doesn't go away matter is endlessly changing it's as if what's in front of the site it's as if um What's in front of the camera changes, the camera doesn't change, you know, for example, the view. <clears throat> um, Ivan, um, I agree with you. I, I agree with you. But the thing is, sometimes the training can bring insensitivity to think of it this way before a person knows something they should be flexible in journeying through various viewpoints right so think of it this way it's like believe it or not it's a bunch of creatures on a rock <clears throat> each one is trying to see as far as they can they see something do you know and based on their ability to communicate hopefully they're able to get close to above 80 percent of what they say you know that means there's many times that like I say a sentence, but it's it's like it's the image is still more than the, that sentence could contain. <clears throat> so the thing is, um, like, why would the founder of Aikido, <laughs> Morio Shiba, say create each day anew? Just think of that statement. Create each day anew. Apply the conscious free will to during the conscious state. You know that, that idiom that says, when in Rome be Roman, you know, act Roman? So it's similarly like when you're a conscious, a biological creature, be a conscious biological creature. If the state of mind shifts, then you can abide by it. A story I have to share, and I'll share it as soon as I just change the song. <laughs> All right. The story begins <clears throat> from this, from the mind and viewpoint and the eyes of this ruthless Japanese warrior 
who was so undefeated that he was enlisted by the imperial army and he became the greatest warrior a man who had been perhaps more than over like uh, you know 70 wars undefeated in 70 wars and that means he has killed many people he has defeated many people he has defeated many minds on the same stage this ruthless warrior suddenly wonders for the first time if people have a soul he's killed so many people on the battlefield he's like if they have a soul where does it go and even though he's undefeated he wonders why it's in some sense if i was defeated what would be the next sight what would be the next experience so he immediately commands to who's beside him and he says like his assistants or whatever and he says go find me the wisest sage and tell me where he is you know and shortly he receives the exact kind of gps instructions <laughs> i'm joking <clears throat> the exact uh coordinates and he finds himself after a long journey after going up this mountain that goes above the clouds He finds himself at the door of this monastery. He pushes the door open as if disappointed why the door hasn't broken itself. <laughs> he walks in, you know, he walks into the room, you know, the Zen master is sitting there drinking tea as if they're having a Zen tea ceremony. Not just contemplating emptiness, but also drinking tea while doing it. Yeah. <laughs> literally drinking emptiness you know the warrior steps in with such intensity as if like a juggernaut literally like not caring for anything and he walks up to the sage noticing the sage is where he is and where he's sitting and he says sage as if he's given a command to a soldier Imagine how machine-like this man's, how power-driven, power makes you into a machine, unfortunately. This is why power is not the point, efficient vision is. But anyways, this warrior says, Sage, tell me now what is heaven and hell, as if shouting, as if a command that's unavoidable, as if if you avoid it, a conse there's consequences. That's wrath. Wrath is when the consequences are... Uh, um, uh, heartless. Now, what happens is the sage takes a sip from his tea. And says, you are too much of a goon and a fool for me to tell you the sage pretty much says you're you're too animalistically violent and goonish and like animalistic for me to tell you it's as if like you're an animal why are you asking questions of the human mind you know you're behaving like an animal why are you asking questions of the human mind in other words and so this insult is heavy. Nobody has insulted this undefeated warrior. Everybody just bowed in fear. But this sage is calling him a goon, you know? <clears throat> Call, he's calling him a fool, you know, to, his, to the face of his ego. That means, believe it or not, the sage took the first blow, get, uh, hit the first strike, struck the guy before. Now check this out. The, the swordsman, the imperial swordsman, just the moment the sage finishes his sentence, his hand as if it's muscle memory, his hand instantly raises his sword straight as if his sword is pointing to the ceiling, as if in one motion he wants to bring it down. 
you know? And in that instant where the sword is right about to land on the sage's head, the sage takes a sip from his cup of tea. <laughs> he doesn't lose sight of this tea ceremony, you know? And the sage, as the sword with the with the wrath of an a, a, an ego, just based on its own world, kind of so assuming its 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 power, you know, as as the wrath of a blind ego is about to hit the sage, and it's pretty sharp. The sage looks at the looks at the guy and instantly says, "This is hell." And there's this complete silence, as if. This moment was so unique and so personal to the mind of the sage and the warrior that all the disciples have become like background silence, you know? <laughs> In that moment, the sage notices there is a strange force that is making him as if this, with the same intensity he's held his, the grip of his hand, the, his mind, his will, with the same intensity as holding his arm. You know, imagine as if another arm holding the arm that is holding, you know, the intensity, right? So it's as if like that's the conscience is, you can say, uh, the, the, the past sense of balance, the ego kind of taking allegiance from the past to bring order to the future. The conscience has a promise to keep to the ordered universe. This is why when chaos arises, it will appear. The imperial swordsman, in that instant, his hand automatically, as if his hand is no longer listening to his ego, as if in that instant, you know, the, the, Zen, the, the Zen master with what he said, he, 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 he threw away the thought of the sword in the hand of this warrior. This warrior instantly, his hand pu pu puts the sword on the ground, instantly as if he's letting go of the sword, instantly becoming mindful of what he has realized. He realized hell is a state of mind. When you're angry, the whole world is burning. Doesn't matter where you look. When you're peaceful, it's as if the the Brahma lo, the the clouds have parted already. So the moment this guy drops the sword, like he's, it's not as if he's just bowing down the sword. He is showing this Zen master, I'm putting away the real uh, that thought of me that I have been living in for so long to return to the novelty of who I am in the present moment. When he puts down the sword and he bows into the moment, he's not bowing to the sage. The sage is, what is he, a temporary sound? Like, <laughs> he's bowing to the moment. And in that moment, <laughs> the sage puts down his cup of tea. So I got to pick up my cup of tea and put it down. <laughs> okay, if I picked it all, I got to drink it. <laughs> he puts down his cup of tea and he says this is heaven and came from the chaos the hidden teaching of the ordered mind free will is the evoker of order one has to not only be content with their objective existence, but many philosophers and mystics, deep down, I, there is many voices, many, many voices of the heart are not reached. The ears of the heart are open, but the many, many voices from the heart never reach the ears of, of, of an artificial, like the, when the values of the society are artificial. That means when human beings act artificially intelligent, we create artificial intelligence. <laughs> This is the moral of the story was that 
any projection of the moment is a generation in the moment. If there is the reality, if if it, if we see, look at what we see and we say, all right, this is a simulation, illusion, okay? Or we look at it and say, all right, this is the truth. Regardless, both moments are moments of generation. You can kind of say before the person has thoughts, neurons are moving around. Somebody says, uh, do, do my neurons to, uh, move my thoughts or do my thoughts move my neurons? When I want to go to the store, did that thought arise and kind of inspire the neural activity or was the thoughts arising in neural activity? The inseparability of the dimensions that man creates to separate and make knowledge complex. Knowledge is a boat. In every generation, the civilization has to be wise enough to steer the boat. So we went, and it oscillates, guys. It's so hilarious. It's as if there are no champions because history repeats. <laughs> it's as if the, the, the first victory was the victory of all. When Buddha, when Buddha kind of said, when he realized, when he got enlightened, he realized at the end that all were enlightened from the beginning. So anyways, guys, I, <clears throat> I feel um, that there is an architecture to thought. Thought can become, move at a certain speed and the free will is its di direction. You can say the airbender moved the elements of the world, the human uh, kind of conscious attention in the moment navigates uh, various points various phenomena comes it's like it's like you see someone and they remind you of someone but they're not that person do you see what i mean it's as if patterns of familiarity are evoked every moment where there is too much unknown where i feel like my moment is going more to like above like let's say 85 percent unknown those are the moments where i gotta make sure in dubai where the longest building burj khalifa exists this dubai was made on sand and these giant cement pillars are holding the whole city above sand so the whole effort of dubai is just advanced engineering do you know that there were certain palaces in europe where the palace's walls were made huge and on the walls were drawn pictures of giant people. And the idea was as the king moved in, in halls where there were figures of giants, giant archetypes on the walls, the being felt he had a giant ego as if the kind of king, the prince was raised in the king's shadow. That's why many younger generations see the mistakes of the past. They see, for example, every person who becomes a parent, of course, must develop a com compassion where, of course, anything, if we are, our abilities are based on how much effort we put at what time. The reason I give so many of these talks is because certain ideas arise that I'm like, if I don't communicate it, there's no way I'm going to be in a state of mind to have that exact image. So it's kind of like, Behind our eyes, life is occurring in instants, in moments, like, like a line is just pure dots, one dot, next dot, next dot. And in another way, it's all like one pure line. So anyways, guys, uh, thanks for listening. Um, I really don't know how, how to do um, the Q&A part, but I'm saying like, if there's any idea, if any person wants me to explain anything about the ideas I've said right now, I can totally explain further because the point is not just somebody talking. It's like the in language, um, there's a design behind it. And it's like, let me tell you what happens. It's like um, when a person finds a great design, because they have such passion for the design, compassion for the design, they want to see the evolution of the design. So what does that mean? That means there will come a moment where you will give this world as much freedom as you're giving yourself and karma will balance. That's it. It's kind of like be mindful of the intensity of, um, of how the moment moves, finding contentment, 
with your moment of being is an ultimate state. Only um, it's a reverse engineering of the micro back into the macro, the macro back into the micro, the micro realizing the void, the void realizing the opportunity of endless infinite creation. So think of it this way, if life is a journey, we are not just traveling in manifestation, we are also traveling in subjective designs. Now, many of these subjective designs are personal. So right now, like I'm kind of giving a voice to um, parallel ver realities and modes and various ways that I see, for example, the moment. For me, it's kind of fascinating when I speak. There's always as if like in behind the scenes, I feel my, my soul is kind of playing with geometry. And what it is, is really you listen to nature. When you listen to nature, you realize a collective vision. When you realize the collective vision, your all individual archetypes that you kind of, uh, that arise, they in some sense can be they can be, you, how can I say it? In an instant, they would say enlightenment can occur. Kabir would say enlightenment takes half of a half of an instant. Right. So, um, Ivan, um, how do you feel that's possible? What you've written in the chat section, we need to have clear boundaries and respect as we are on a similar path. Yeah, 8 billion creatures. I mean, where else can we go? You know, we're in the same room. So eight, imagine 8 billion people in the same room. What's the most efficient outcome of them? I'm kind of asking that question. Yeah, yeah, do it. Be free. Be free. I just want to see kind of like how far what is said is being seen. Or how far the vision of people are. It, it, for me, it's, it's kind of like, um, how would I say it? It's like the world, when it's ready, it communicates. It's like when it's time, the season, it's like spring happens. How can it, um, what is it that's common in both of those experiences, Ivan? 
I feel that enlightenment is just realizing the light is being in your eyes. <laughs> Maybe that's too simple, but what it is, is, is a sort of acknowledgement thing, experiential acknowledgement thing. I think it's, um, I kind of see reality, especially civilization, having kind of like, imagine from artificial, savage kind of cultural, social kind of programs. It's as if it's slowly kind of purifying. So I see civilization kind of shifting its value system. But the thing is, is that too, so many people are invested in playing the old game. They don't, they, they're not even wondering about the new board game. So we're here wondering about that new board game. And I feel like sometimes I wonder in the next hundred years, what would people's sense of identity be? Would we still think that we are, imagine like they could connect a person's head to a computer. And that person could literally be in that in their head, but it's like imagine close their eyes and also be somewhere somewhere else in a, in a robotic body or something, their consciousness, right? So imagine something like that happens. <clears throat> so what does that mean? That means a sort of question of how much is the past technology necessary. So evolution means something has to change, of course. So think of life as if it's like life has been, it's not like life or death. It's as if one moment and one one occurrence. Really, I, when I realize everything is kind of hovering in empty space, I'm like, how can I fear space? So you see, it, it's like every person has, every person's uh, view on the world is a unique geometrical pattern that deserves to be shared with the world. So I find that um, at least the greatest effort is authentic, honest, in accordance to who you are as a person looking at life anew. Like from a, as if like the same way a writer gets a completely new piece of paper and writes, simply just find a moment, simple moment where you just stop having any sort of opinion and just look. And then just noticing how, how values arise for you throughout the day. Just kind of like a person who wakes up really early in the morning, they're experiencing a silence that then they suddenly hear the noises in the day emerge from. So from it's like this conscious silence and then suddenly the person starts hearing the cars outside in the streets. So anyways, guys, um, I hope this talk was helpful. And um, thought cityism is a philosophical view that suggests that the metaphors of the objective realm can serve the subjective uh, advancement. We are, it's kind of interesting, but in the Christian tra tradition, Christ had this thing where he said, to be in the world, but not of, not of it. And I thought about that quote for a long time. To be in the world and to not be, uh, uh, and to not be of it. So what does that mean? That means to be present and acknowledging that what you see is temporary. The seer is attributeless, so it's, it will remain forever unknown. That means what we can't see belongs to the realm of the personal imagination. But what we can objectively truly see belongs belongs in common reality so if people began communicating their inner realms as i say you know we, we have, it's like you know 2020 january 1st right now and i find this it's like we have entered we have entered the battlefield and the battlefield is a recognition of this war of language that has been going on and what that means is the species there's an alien invasion but this alien invasion is in the sort of an ideological possession. When I, I mean, I shouldn't say possession, an ideological uh, kind of limiting your attention to one view. Sometimes it's better to try to live in every moment with at least the effort towards uh, a, a greater vision. That effort is liberating. Sometimes in life, those last to move 
in some sense, um, <sighs> exit first. Um, okay, guys, um, I got to end the talk. Um, there's an issue with the computer, but uh, I want to thank everybody for listening. I find that uh, we have to have a new sensitivity to language. We got to treat language in new ways and in some sense have new subjective visions. In some sense, humanity's structure and civilization should be related to the biological body. In a world where technology may replace us soon, we must care, make the objective biological body very important. Not to worship it, but to, in some sense, uh, shape the branches of knowledge in accordance to it, so that children, by learning the, as if they learn health in school for, first, when they learn about the medical sciences, then then they begin to kind of from the body realize how it's like even their hand can fractally represent uh, the various kind of dimensions of how we how ideology is like a city held in the air. So anyways, guys, uh, I appreciate uh, the listeners and um, when you write something that is beyond your own expectations, you will always know it. Much blessings and honesty.